Hi everyone, welcome to a new video about the listening test. Thank you very much for trusting me to help you learn and master English. Please keep listening and focusing on these tests to train your brain to understand the English language. This is very important for you. Don't forget to subscribe to be able to receive all the updates about this channel. I wish you the best of luck in your listening test. Part 1. You'll hear someone booking transport for a trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem and I was wondering if you could help us out. What is the problem exactly? Well, we normally take our students on an excursion at the end of their course. But unfortunately, the coach firm we normally use has let us down. It seems they've gone out of business. I'm sorry to hear that. I suppose you are looking for a replacement. Well, yes. We won't need a very large coach, actually. There will be 30 students and four teachers. So that's 34 in all. And what dates did you have in mind? The last Saturday and Sunday of this month. That's the 28th and 29th. The 28th and 29th. Does that mean you are planning to stay somewhere overnight? That's right. Actually, we want to do the same excursion that we do every year. We usually visit Stonehenge, Salisbury and stay overnight in Bath. It's a historical tour, really. It sounds interesting. Let me just see what we have available. Oh dear, I'm afraid all our coaches are booked out for the 28th. It's the busiest time of the year for us, actually. I was afraid that would be a problem. But you have a coach available for the 29th? Yes, we do. And it's available for the 30th as well, if that's any help to you. I'm afraid not. Sunday is the last day. The students go home on Monday. I think we'll just have to change our plans a bit and leave out Salisbury. It's a shame, but I don't think we can fit in all three places in one day. So, you would like to book the coach for the 29th, visiting Stonehenge and Bath, is that right? Yes, I think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. Right, I just need a few details, sir. OK. My name is Paul Scott. S-C-O-T? It's double T, actually. I'm sorry. And it's the Down Language School. Could you give me the address for that, Mr Scott? Yes, it's Down House, Hill Street, Brighton. Do you need the postcode? No, that's not necessary but I do need a contact number. Of course. The number for the school secretary is 01273 512 634. You can contact her if you need to speak to anyone. Right. And what time would you like the coach to pick you up? Well, I think we'll have to make an early start. Would 7.30 be all right? Yes, no problem at all. What time do you want to be back? Oh, any time between 10 and 11 will be all right. Not later than 11, though. 
Right, I'll make a note of that. 11 p.m. latest. There's just one more thing I need to know. Presumably you'll be visiting Stonehenge first. How long do you want to stay there? Well, we normally stay about an hour. The main objective of the excursion is for the students to see the Georgian architecture in Bath, really. Yes, Bath is lovely, isn't it? I was there myself a couple of years ago. I thought the Royal Crescent was absolutely stunning. I hadn't realised how large it is. Well, I think that's all I need to know, Mr Scott. Thank you for booking with us. Just a minute. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. How much will this cost? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was thinking about Bath. Just bear with me a moment. Yes, it's a round trip of 300 miles and a total time of 16 hours for the driver. For a 45-seater coach, that will be a total of £500, including tax and insurance. Do we have to have such a large coach? There are only 34 of us. We don't have any smaller coaches, I'm afraid. Oh, well. At least we won't be cramped for space. When do we have to pay? We require a 20% deposit to confirm the booking. I suggest that you do that as soon as possible, today if you can. The balance you can give to the driver if you're paying by cheque. Have the cheque made out to Burnham Coaches. I think that'll be all right. I will have to check this with the school accountant, but if all is well, I'll arrange for someone to bring you the deposit within the next two hours. That'll be fine, Mr Scott. Well, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 15. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery.
Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. So, the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrolls a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we're studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, so there are significant differences. 
when you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories, and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listing techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture on time. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. The subject of this series of lectures is horology, the science of measuring time, and we'll be looking at a few basic concepts in this lecture. The measurement of time has come a long way since ancient times. It began with such devices as the sundial, where the position of the sun's shadow marked the hour. Daylight was divided into twelve. Temporary hours; these temporary hours were longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, simply because the amount of daylight changes with the seasons. The earliest sundial we know comes from Egypt. It was made of stone and is thought to date from 1500 BC. Sundials were used throughout the classical world, and with time, evolved into more elaborate devices that could take into account seasonal changes. And geographical positioning, and reflect the hours accurately, no matter what the time of year. This was quite an achievement in technology. Today, sundials can be seen as decorative pieces in many gardens. In the 11th century, the Chinese invented the first mechanical clocks. They were large and expensive, and certainly not intended for individuals. However, this is the type of clock we are familiar with today. There have been many developments in clocks and watches since then, and they have been greatly improved. But if your clock or watch makes a ticking sound, then it could well be based on the mechanical movements the Chinese developed a thousand years ago. However, timekeeping has moved on from the mechanical clock. Time has become so important that there is a series of atomic clocks around the world which measure international atomic time. Even though many countries have their own calendars, globalization has made it essential that we measure time uniformly. That we know, for example, that when that when it's six a.m. in the United Kingdom, it's two p.m. in Beijing. This standard was set in 1958. Now these atomic clocks are situated in over 70 laboratories all over the world. There is so much to cover about the development of time measurement. That I would like to refer you to the reading list. The core text is the development of time, theory and practice, but there are many other useful texts. A good grounding in the subject is given in Understanding Time by J. R. Beale. Although some sections lack detailed analyses, it does offer a good foundation. Also, Time, Concepts and Conventions is quite a useful read. You might think from the title that it's about the philosophy of time, but this isn't the case. Rather, it gives a good description of how different countries have different approaches to time in terms of calendars and days. Lastly, the story of time by David Harris analyzes time in great detail, and I would recommend this book if you are aiming to specialize in horology. Now, we're going to continue with an in-depth look at lunar and solar cycles. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.